Welcome, in this video we're going to be exploring the house of Jehu and all the archaeology we have for this dynasty, which began with King Jehu himself and consisted of his four descendants. It reached its peak with Jeroboam II, who was the most powerful king in all of Israel's history. And the king, the prophet Amos, will confront. But before we get into all of that, we must get our historical bearings. So the kingdom of Israel begins with Jeroboam I, who broke away from the southern tribes. And for the first 50 years of its existence, kings are constantly killing each other for the throne, until we get a period of stability under the house of Omri, which reigns for 40 years. But then Jehu, a military commander, usurps the throne. So Jehu now becomes king and his four descendants after him. The house of Jehu was in power for 90 years, and this makes it the longest dynasty in all of Israel's history. Now, let's get something very clear. Israel in the 8th century was not important. It was a vassal of Assyria. When King Jehu was on the throne, Shalmaneser III was the king of Assyria, and Shalmaneser was a very strong king, and the other nations were terrified of him. Israel paid him a lot of tribute, as evidenced in the Black Obelisk. See my previous video for more on that. And in exchange for this tribute, Israel prospered, because they had peace. Although tribute is often seen as a negative, for a small country like Israel, the firm hand of Assyria prevented other nations from attacking them. Now, when Shalmaneser's son, Shamshi Adad, took the throne, everything changed. He was a weak king, which meant a power vacuum formed, which on one hand means Israel doesn't have to pay tribute anymore, which sounds great. But let's remember, without Assyria keeping everyone else in check, Israel is now vulnerable. And sure enough, into this vacuum steps Hazael of Aram Damascus, and he brutalizes Israel. So now we enter a period of Aram Damascus dominance. Hazael and his son Ben-Hadad III continually attack Jehoahaz of Israel. We read in 2 Kings 13 the following, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them continually into the hand of Hazael king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad the son of Hazael. We continue to read in verse 7. For there was not left to Jehoahaz an army of more than 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. End quote. During this time, even Jehoahaz, the king of Judah, couldn't escape from Hazael. We read in 2 Kings 12 that Jehoash had to give Hazael the temple treasure to prevent him from invading Judah. Commenting on this period, one author notes, taken as a whole, the available evidence for this period suggests that Hazael did not simply dominate Israel and Judah occasionally, but actually established a small empire in Syria-Palestine in the last half of the 9th century BCE. Israel and Judah were apparently vassal states under the control of Aram Damascus, end quote. We also have some archaeology that validates this Damascus rule as well. Here is a bronze piece of armor from the front of a horse. Inscribed on it reads, quote, This is what Hadad gave our lord Hazael of the valley of Bashan. End quote. Now after the death of Hazael, his son Ben-Hadad III continues his rule. But before we move on, let me stop for a moment and thank the sponsors of this video, none other than my patrons who keep this channel alive. If you're enjoying this content and believe in the goal of this channel, which is to create a library of videos that objectively and respectfully analyze the Bible, please consider becoming a patron today. Please also make sure you hit that like button, leave me a comment, and subscribe. Reading your comments is always the highlight of my day, and if we could get to 70 likes on this video, that would be terrific. All right, back to the content now. Let's bring back our timeline. It's time now to move on to our next Assyrian king, who is Adad Na'ari III, who is a strong king unlike his father. And he reasserts Assyrian dominance, so Israel is no longer under the thumb of Aram Damascus. Israel once again enters a period of peace and prosperity, but in exchange, they must pay tribute to Assyria. And we find this on the Tel Arima Stella, which reads as follows, quote, Adad Na'ari, mighty king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, son of Shamsi Adad, the king of the universe, king of Assyria, the son of Shalmaneser, the king of the four quarters. We continue to read. I received 2,000 talents of silver, 1,000 talents of copper, 2,000 talents of iron, 3,000 linen garments with multicolored trim, the tribute of Mari, the land of Damascus. And this Mari of Damascus is thought to be just another name for Ben-Hadad III. We continue to read on the stella that Jehoahash of Israel also paid tribute. We read, quote, I received the tribute of Jehoahash, the Sumerian, of the Tyrian ruler and of the Sidonian ruler, end quote. 
Again, it's important to remember that this tribute kept Israel safe. Better to pay tribute to Assyria than to be ravaged by Ram Damascus. So during this period of time, Israel once again flourished. One author writes, quote, Armenian dominance came to an end when Assyria experienced a resurgence under the next king, Adonari III. Since Israel was aligned as an Assyrian vassal from the time of Jehu's submission in 841 BCE, Assyria's revival meant resurgence for Israel, end quote. And Israel reached its ultimate peak as a nation under the rule of Jeroboam II, who was the most powerful king in all of Israel's history. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of archaeology on him. We only have this bulla, which belonged to one of his servants. It would have been used to seal royal documents. It has an image of a lion on it and an inscription that reads, quote, Shema, servant of Jeroboam. So the reason why we know that Jeroboam was so powerful isn't from archaeology, but rather from what we read in 2 Kings 14, which reads, quote, King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, began to reign in Samaria. He reigned 41 years. Let's just stop here for a moment. This makes him the longest reigning monarch in all of Israel's history. We continue to read, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, that he caused Israel to sin. We continue. He restored the border of Israel from Lebeth Hamath as far as the Sea of Abath. All right, let's stop here again. This is the greatest territorial expansion in Israel's history. Jeroboam basically conquers all of Aram Damascus. We continue to read that this expansion was, quote, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, son of Amati, the prophet, who was from gath Hepa. All right, let's just stop here for a moment. This is just a fun little piece of Bible trivia. This Jonah, son of Amati, who appears to be a prophet in the court of Jeroboam II, is none other than the Jonah who was swallowed by the fish, who will eventually go to preach against Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. So just a fun piece of Bible trivia there. Let's now get back to our main point, which is that Jeroboam II is the most powerful king in all of Israel's history. As one author notes, quote, with the yoke of Aram Damascus broken by the rod of Assyria, Jeroboam II transformed Israel's international standing by restoring the ancient boundaries. Thus, Jeroboam II's 41-year reign stands as a high watermark for the northern kingdom economically and militarily, end quote. Thus, during the reign of Jeroboam II, Israel is safe and stable. And with this comes enormous wealth for the elite, and unfortunately, a return to paganism. So herein enters the prophet Amos, and he preaches against Israel's greed and idolatry. He demands exclusive worship of Yahweh and justice for the poor, a message that will echo through the centuries and inspire the likes of Martin Luther King Jr., who famously borrowed the language of Amos, declaring, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. So in our next video, we'll be exploring the book of Amos. So make sure you hit that like button, leave me a comment and subscribe so you're ready for that next video. If you really want to support my work and keep this channel going, please consider becoming a patron. Patrons keep this channel alive. And in return for becoming a patron, you'll get a longer version of all of my videos. For example, for this video here, we'll go through some more key moments in the house of Jehu, dig a bit deeper into the archaeology, and go through some strange Bible story in this section as well. So please consider becoming a patron today to really support the channel. Thank you for watching until the end, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.